Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Switch this mic around a little bit. I have a story I want to walk through today, and I'm really happy to see all of you here and ready to listen to this story. We have a story that unfolds about the state of affairs, the challenges facing women in information technology, and you know where are we going and what can we do about it, and, and bring it into an imperial context. Um, you may have thought that all of the issues about gender diversity in the workplace were solved long ago and they don't have any place today. But I think there are many issues that remain. I find this statistic very troubling. At the current graduation rates, we will only fill about 30% of the computing related jobs that we need to fill. This is not good news for higher education or for the universities that need to hire this talent. And, and this is coming from the United States Department of Labor. They're saying that you know between 2010 and 2020, we have a growing economy. It's based on technology. And we need to hire people into those fields. Uh, but we're not graduating them. And that's men and women. If you look at this infographic from the National Center for Women and in Information Technology, uh, we can see that green bar of women is, is shrinking. It's shrinking for everybody. And we have to be concerned, but we need to be concerned about women in the profession. This is a time when we need more graduates, and this is what's coming through the pipeline. It's, it, these are scary numbers. We're settling in at about 25% uh, of the profession. If you look at this, this graph, if I get it. This is the percentage of computing occupations held by women since 1991. So we are in a steady decline since the early 1990s. And if we look at this, Graphic. What you see on the horizontal bar is, is age. And the yellow line here is the uh, percentage of people who are working in, in their chosen major for their profession. So we start out at about 60% of the grads working in their profession. It starts to decline for women. And around age 30 to 35, they leave the workforce in STEM fields. We all know what happens around those ages, right? That's when they start having families. And so you might be inclined to think that they're staying home with the kids. But follow-up research shows that's not the case. They are simply leaving STEM professions. They may stay home for a couple of years, but when they go back to work, they seek careers in other areas. If we were to mitigate just that gap, that would produce an additional 220,000 women, well-qualified women, ready to enter into technology fields. Now you might start to think, well, why pay a lot of attention to this? Diversity matters. Technology is everywhere. We are all impacted by technology. We saw the map from Ian this morning. Thanks, Ian, for all of those wonderful global maps that shows that technology is universal. It affects all of us. It impacts all of us. It affects everyone regardless of age, gender, racial, background, cultural background. And if we're going to have a technology future that's really engaging everyone, we need to keep this in mind. Diversity matters because we improve our problem solving and we improve our perspectives on the problems that we need to solve by having diverse teams. In a study of more than 100 teams at 21 companies, teams with equal numbers of women 
in men were more likely to experiment, more likely to be creative, they were more likely to share knowledge, and they fulfilled tasks better than teams of any other composition. Think about that in terms of the projects that you work on, where we need innovation, we need creativity. We will find that if we have diverse teams. Additional studies indicate that under the right conditions, teams comprising diverse members outperform teams comprising highest ability members. Think about that. We tend to put together a team and we get the best people of the highest ability and put them together and think that team is going to outperform any other kind of team composition. The research does not show that. The research tends to suggest that diverse teams do better. Diversity adds perspective. And to be effective, we need to consider all aspects of diversity. That includes age diversity, where I see in my department some skill areas being occupied or <coughs> really heavily employing people of an older age group, and I'm trying to bring in younger people. So I have age diversity because I need fresh perspectives. Gender diversity, we need perspectives of everyone that's using technology. Cultural diversity, racial diversity. We improve our work cultures by paying attention to all aspects of diversity. And that includes skill diversity and interest diversity. Diversity adds perspective when we're expanding technical innovation. In a large part, we start to miss out on the valuable perspectives that women and other underrepresented groups bring to designing the technology that we need for the future. The business world is paying attention to this. Let's look at a few comments from leaders in our business world. You probably are following this national conversation initiated by Sheryl Sandberg, who is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for Facebook, she also worked at Google. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg starts to talk about international competitiveness, and I'll read her quote. An understanding of computer science is becoming increasingly essential in today's world, thinking about global technology. Our national competitiveness depends on our ability to educate our children, and that includes girls in this critical field. So you think, well, okay, she's female, she's got this book to promote, she's going to say things like that, right? But we also have men telling this story, and we have Bill Gates speaking, or telling a story of speaking in Saudi Arabia, where four-fifths of the audience was male and sitting on one side of the room, and one-fifth of the audience was female sitting on the other side of the room in cloaks and veils. A partition separated the two segments of the audience. And toward the end of the question and answer session, a member of the audience noted that Saudi Arabia aimed to be one of the top 10 in the world in technology by 2010 and asked if this was realistic. And Bill Gates says that he responded, well, if you're not fully utilizing half the talent in the country, you're not going to get close to the top 10. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is really paying attention to educating girls around the world and bringing women into the profession. You know who this guy is? Warren Buffett? Business magnet, investor. He puts it this way. No manager operates his or her plants at 80% efficiency when steps could be taken to, that would increase output. And no CEO wants male employees to be underutilized when improved training or working conditions would boost productivity. So take it one step further. If obvious benefits flow from helping the male component of the workforce achieve its potential, why in the world wouldn't you want to include its counterpart? 
We've seen what can be accomplished when we use 50% of our human capacity. If you visualize what 100% can do, you'll join me in an unbridled optimist about America's future. He didn't write this 10 years ago. This was in May 2013, Fortune magazine. Business leaders are paying attention to this growing issue. So in summary, the American economy needs more technology capable people in the workforce at a time when we're graduating fewer and fewer people overall and fewer and fewer women. Diverse teams are more innovative, more creative, and provide better problem solving. So we need to prioritize the diverse team development that we need in our organizations. That means we need to attract, retain, and use all of the available talent. Not 50% of the cap capacity, but all of the available talent to achieve the goals. So what keeps us from getting there? What are some of the challenges that women face? Well, I, I'm a, a bit of a dinosaur. I can remember starting my career at a time when you didn't tell anybody you got pregnant at work because you got fired if you were pregnant. We've come a long way since those days. There's still a lot to do. One of the big challenges that we see is what's known as the imposter syndrome. It affects women. You will also read about it a lot in universities. It's uh, something that affects men and women both in PhD pursuit. But just recently in the New York Times, May of this uh, year, there was an article called How to Be a Woman Programmer. Not how to be a programmer, how to be a woman programmer. And one woman programmer stated, I found that being a woman put me at, put me at one remove from the general society of programmers. I resented that distance. We women found ourselves nearly alone, outsiders in a culture that was sometimes rigorously hierarchical, occasionally friendly, occasionally welcoming. This strange illness, meanwhile, left female survivors with an odd glow. Think about what she's saying here. Illness, survivors, odd glow. These are words we want to describe our profession made them too visible, scrutinized too closely, held to higher standards. It placed upon them the terrible burden of not being only good, but the best. So this feeling of being an outsider, an imposter whose skills are not enough, is one challenge. A feeling of, of being in the spotlight, of having maybe a little too much focus on everything, is an intimidating factor. These are huge challenges. Wikipedia describes the imposter syndrome as the psychological experience of believing that one's accomplishments came about not through genuine ability, but as a result of having been lucky, having worked harder than others, or having manipulated other people's impressions. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to women and said, well, what made you successful? And I heard, I was really lucky. Not I was really smart. Not that I was really capable of programming. We can sell ourselves short. Patrick Lencioni describes five ways a team becomes dysfunctional. And the base layer is absence of trust, on which build fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and in the attention to results. But if that foundation of trust is built on you being able to be who you really are in the workplace, who you really are on a team, and instead, you're dealing with fear of exposing your vulnerabilities to the group and fear that if you show any weakness at all, it's going to be used against you. You don't have trust in the workplace. You don't have trust on the team. 
and you're walking into what Lencioni describes as team dysfunctional operations. So we need to remove the imposter syndrome. Another issue that women face is harassment. And I have to tell you, I was somewhat surprised when I started researching this presentation, I learned that sexual harassment and even sexual assault is on the increase, in particular at industry and open source conferences and in online gaming. Did anybody follow the Adria Richards story earlier this year? Yes, a couple. But Adria Richards was hired to be a tech evangelist in the Python community. That was her job, to talk about and promote Python. She attended the PyCon conference. During the conference, and I'll shorten the story a bit, she was uh, sitting behind two gentlemen who were talking during the presentation. So the presentation was talking about a code repository. The two gentlemen in front of her were talking about the repository. She became more and more uncomfortable with how they were talking during the conference. And they started talking about the repository, and they started talking about forking the repository, forking the repo, getting a little giggly. She got more and more uncomfortable. Her solution was to take their picture and tweet about it. She tweeted about, oh, I can't believe they're having this discussion. And she was doing this as the tech evangelist at the PyCon conference. The conference organizers found the two gentlemen and escorted them from the conference. One of the gentlemen subsequently lost his job for his behavior at the conference. She was also fired from her job for tweeting about the events because the backlash from the community was so significant that her employer no longer felt she could be successful as the tech evangelist for Python. Now, that's a, I think this is a great story to print out and talk about in your organizations. I took this into a sophomore computer science class that I teach and said, here's what happened, here's the story, what do you think? My class was is uh, 26 men, four women. The 26 young men in the class said, what is the deal? Why didn't you just say to the, the guys, this is bothering me? And the four women all said, I would be so intimidated. I would never say that. But I, the question and a very good discussion followed, I, you weren't so intimidated to, you know, obviously Adria wasn't that intimidated. She took a picture, she tweeted it. Was it fair on that uh, side of the house to out these people by tweeting about it? It generates a very good discussion, but we need to be aware that events in our community can be very hostile to women. So much so that a new group has been formed called the ADA Initiative, and you can look them up online. Their goal is to develop anti-harassment policies for conferences, and they work closely with the Ubuntu Developer Summits and all the Linux Foundation events. This is something we have to watch and pay attention to. Another challenge that women face is the blending of work and family. And we'll find those kinds of comments directed at moms and moms-to-be much more often than fathers and, and fathers-to-be. We sort of expect that men will automatically get how to blend work and family life, where it's just as much a challenge for everybody to bring that new baby home and go through those sleepless nights. Sheryl Sandberg, again, talks about the importance of leaning in to your career and not stepping back. And none of us should really step back from our careers. You don't want to leave, she says, before you leave. She's, and she noted that women can start to pull back from challenging assignments and career advancement, even if, if there's just a perception 
that's going to disrupt family life. There can be societal pressures and your, uh, if you don't have good role models about how to deal with life events, and, and I'm here to say life happens to everybody. We all will deal with life events. If you don't have role models for how to deal with life events, it can become overwhelming and challenging. So the challenges we face in summary, it's an interaction, interaction can improve technical abilities and increase success. Those interactions can be negative if bullied or spotlighted into an imposter position or sexually harassed in an industry event. And if family and friends start to question commitment, additional pressures make perseverance very, very difficult. Most women don't leave their careers lightly. They, and if you think about it, if our students are going into debt, $40,000, $50,000 to earn a degree, and then women with that amount of debt are only working in that profession 10, 12 years and abandoning it, this is not economically sustainable for anybody. So what can we do? All of you in this room, all of us, we do have a lot that we can, we can do. We can contribute to solving these problems. First, I'd like, it to, like to suggest that you become familiar with the websites and the resources available out there. There's a lot of material out there. Discussions can really help. Now, if you add all of this up, what I've been talking about so far, you've got the negative interactions, you've got the feeling like an imposter, you've got an inability to see how you're going to manage work and home life. You've got individual women making a lot of small decisions that lead up to a big career shift. But if we start looking at these resources and become familiar with the, the material that's out there, perhaps we can make a shift here. There's a, if you haven't read Lean In yet, uh, I would also recommend reading that book. There's a, another, oh, there's more to this. Another piece that I would like to suggest is mentor a group. Remember that, that um, we have a lot of mentoring ability, um, groups out there right now, a lot of people offering to mentor or set up mentoring relationships. But if you think about that imposter syndrome and the pressure that women are under, that, that feeling of being in the spotlight with a one-on-one -on -one mentoring can be really, really difficult. Now, I've been very lucky. During my career, after I graduated, the first job that I had, these, uh, one of the first senior systems analysts at Ford Motor was the father of one of the attorneys that worked in the firm that I was working at. And he gave me a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring in a very positive way that enabled me to successfully start my career. A database administrator along the way told me when I was looking for shifts, you can be a database administrator. You can do this and I will help you. And I appreciate to this day all the things that he did for me in my career. Scott Siddall uh, from Longsight, is he in the audience? There he is in the back. Um, Scott was very instrumental in mentoring me into the CIO group with Educause, a terrific, terrific introduction to national events in the national stage. Uh, Ron Signal, who was the CIO at Oakland University prior to me and was out frequently sick, told me, move in my office, sit in my chair, and make somebody move you out whenever I'm not here, which was great advice because he said if you leave it as a vacuum, they'll want to fill it. Make sure that they see you and they think, oh, they've got to move her out in order to move me, somebody else in. Dr. Verinder Mugel was the uh, provost that hired me as CIO, a man of great integrity, uh, uh, superior support. He is now president at Lawrence Technology University. I just rattled off 
the names of several men who were my mentors. It stands to reason in a profession that's largely male, that mentors are largely going to be male. And that's great. And I encourage you to look around for mentors or people to mentor of different genders. And you can do this very comfortably in a group, sitting around a table, because again, that spotlight, that feeling of being the um, being found out can be overwhelming. Whereas if you're a group of problem solvers sitting around a table, a lot of that stress goes away. Uh, I think groups of three to five can be terrific ways.